Say hello to the new SwimOutlet.com. Enhanced navigation, larger, higher resolution imagery, more filtering and search capability so you can find what you need faster. As always, low price guarantee and free shipping on $49. The redesigned SwimOutlet.com. Dive in, say hi. This is the Morning Swim Show for Friday, August 29th, 2014. I'm Tiffany Elias. Now, yesterday we aired an interview with Katie Ledecky discussing her 1500 world record. And today we went back in the archives to present an interview between Bruce Weigo and George Breen. Breen broke the record in the world, the world record in the 1500 under Doc Councilman 60 years ago. Now, take a look at this interview where Breen goes back in time to discuss his swimming career and the Olympic Games. I'm Bruce Weigo in Anaheim, California with Swimming World Television. I'm sitting here with George Breen, the great world record holder and Doc Councilman's first great swimmer. And George, I'd like to take you back a little bit about your experience. You went to Cortland State as a rower and Doc Councilman was there as a swim coach. How did you get on the swim team? Well, I just went out for the swim team because it, at Cortland they didn't have rowing. And so I had no choice to do something, and I knew I could swim, and I was the best swimmer back in my rowing club back in Buffalo. So you started training with Doc Councilman, and the rest is history. But tell me a little bit about that history at Cortland State. What was, your, what was the record? What was the swim team like when you were there? Well, the swim team hadn't done much before that, and Doc made a lot of changes, and, of course, the training that went on. But... Uh, I swam there actually four years and then an extra year. We were there five years and it, was just, it just started out from the beginning. He discovered I could swim distance after about two months and then it was just history after that, a gradual continual process of going up the ladder, um, one goal after another and uh, he was there the, the whole time, the five years. Now I've seen, uh, I remember seeing movies of you swimming and your, your stroke out of the water was described as not really what the prettiest stroke would be. Did Doc make any attempt to change or correct your strokes in any way or did he just let you swim the way you swam? Not a whole lot, really. No, he let me swim. But th I, that was something I did be before I came with him. I had a drag kick, a two-beat crossover. I had my left arm went high, my right arm went more normal. Um, he, he, all he did was concentrate on underwater. Well, how I felt underwater, and it went pretty good according to what he said. And um, I, minor things that he would mention, a hand placement or something, um, like a way that I catch or something. And and it, the big thing it was training. It was just teaching training something beyond what you know. It was after World War II, and it was a whole revision of how much people trained. And I was doing more than anyone else in the country, but I didn't know it for two years till I went to the NCAs and I heard other people talking, and I found out oh. I'm doing twice as much as anyone else. And, you know, he was a man so far ahead of his time, and I just happened to have that stroke of luck of being at his first full-time coaching job and, and, and being his first uh, national champion. But it was a gradual process. I, you know, I had no, no idea that I would ever accomplish what I did. Well, I've heard it, I've heard it said that uh, you're, pretty you're pretty much responsible for Doc ending up in Indiana. Can you tell me a little bit about how Doc moved from Cortland State to Indiana, and did you go with him? Oh yeah, uh, in the summer of 1957 we were at the Nationals and an alumnus of Indiana asked him if he would be interested in the, in the position it was going to be opening up the, uh, and, and through the winter and he said of course yeah and it was my swimming, I was na defending national champion and I won again in, in Philadelphia and that's what started. So when he, he picked up and left actually after the first week of school we packed up his station wagon and took off with another swimmer named Kenny Peters and we drove out to Indiana and I went out there and they got me into the service six months I came out and started training again and Doc got me into grad school and I didn't even belong in grad school and then I swam with the Indiana team for a year and then in my last year in 1959-1960 I swam in Indianapolis with the age group team with a fellow named Gene Lee but I consider that Doc was my only coach for my whole career, which is an unusual thing for a world-class swimmer. Of course, today, no one would fall in that category because I didn't start swimming uh, competitively until I was 17. Went into Although the Olympics in Melbourne as the world record holder, and there was one of the great races of all time with Yamanaka and Murray Rose. And is that, uh, what are your thoughts when you think back of that race? 
Well, they weren't too good on the, the day of, <laughs> the memories from the day of when it happened. But what I did was uh, I had gone in with, the, the, well, I went in just before I got there. Murray had broken the world record, but I was doing times that were real fast. And um, I set a world record in the 800, 800, 880 yards up at uh, New Haven in late October. Um, in the prelims on a Wednesday night, uh, I set the world record in the prelims. And I was coasting. Everybody claims that I put too much into it, but I was, I really felt like a million dollars. I was hardly breathing. It felt great. Uh, two days later, of course, was the showdown with the other two. And um, I always use the expression that it felt like uh, someone took my lane line and squeezed it to about three feet wide, which is an expression uh, otherwise known as panic, choke, whatever. Today, I mean, I can laugh about it, and you know, as the years gone on, when I've been coaching and give speeches, try to explaining to people how this can happen to you. And then Murray's winning time was uh, six seconds slower than what I did, so I went home with the Olympic record and the world record, and third place uh, behind you know Yamanaka and Rose. So it made an unusual footnote in Olympic history. Well, when I look back at the films of that, and I see at every turn. You guys, for the first at least 800 yards, you guys are making open. I think you were had the lead, but everybody's making open turns on those laps. Why? What was what was so impossible about doing flip turns in those days? Nobody did flip turns and long stuff. The only time you flipped was when you did 100. Maybe some of not even a long course 200. I don't remember anybody doing it. You didn't do flip turns because at that time you had to touch the wall with your hand, and in going over, everyone felt like it was a strain. And remember, it was. If it didn't exist, people didn't think you could do it. Like when the flip turn came in in the early 60s, Don Gambrell took all his little age groupers and made them flip every single turn, and he was the first kid, the first ones to do it. And even then, people were like, well, flip some, not flip some. And Don made everybody flip everything, and they did it. And it, it was an automatic reflex that they, that they just could do it. But in our time, we thought that was holding our breath too long. And at, I, in fact, I flipped turned in my last national 1500 because I was so excited. I was up with my teammate, Al Summers, and he had won the national for a couple of years, and I won. And we were roommates, teammates, travel together. And I was so excited I was up with him that I flipped the last turn, and I actually caught a, a, a doc took me aside and chastised me for being a hot dog for doing a flip turn on the last turn. Nobody did flip turn. Uh, nobody did flip turns on the long events. It was just well at the at the recent uh, world championships. Uh, Michael Phelps in his 200 or 400 freestyle, whatever it is, or off the IM flipped the last turn and held for seven or eight dolphin kicks while all the other swimmers came up. What what do you think about that? I mean, com when you think back of your days and you think about how they're doing turns today, what goes through your mind? Oh, I it 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 doesn't it doesn't relate because we used I would have thought I was choking to death or I was you know that I would pass out. Uh, it's just a matter I did master swimming uh, when I was in my 40s and I would flip every turn and it was nothing because everyone did it and you, you didn't think anything of it. It's like anything in what I've watched over the years of swimming, how fast it's gotten. Uh, you know, I saw Hackett swim a 1500 and when he finished, I turned to Al Summers, my teammate, and we were on the, both on the Olympic team in 60, and I turned to Al and, and when, he, when he finished, and he just, it was just a swim. It wasn't the big championship, it was that duel in the pool. He had already swum a 200, which I can't even believe he did that. And then he did that, he did the 1500, and when he finished, it was the new U.S. Open record, fastest time. And I turned to Al and I said, hey, Al, we got 270 meters to go. So it doesn't, it doesn't even compute uh, when they do that. I have age groupers that can do the same thing. It, uh, I think it's just astounding. I'm always amazed. Uh, I'm always, as things keep progressing, I'm always, each time it comes up, I'm still always amazed, and, and I enjoy seeing it. Uh, anything that happens new, I, I still get a big kick out of it. One thing in talking to Phil Moriarty when he was at Yale and when you guys were doing more distance than them, Kippeth would not let them work out more than an hour and a half or two hours because the chlorine was so bad on their eyes that they couldn't study. Were you going beyond that at that time? Was that one of the secrets that you were doing more yardage and what was happening to your eyes at that time? Uh, whoa, double vision. Uh, rings around the light. All Every time you looked at a light, it uh, rings around it. I won summer in 1958 in Broad Ripple in Indianapolis, Indiana. We trained there. The scoring was so strong, I actually had double vision in one eye until something like November. And um, 
we uh, it, it was a, an aggravation oh a terrible aggravation uh, not having goggles and um, we it, it was tough to withstand it I can remember times in Indianapolis the, the year that I was there my last year of swimming in the winter I would go in and the place was open for a couple hours and I'd be there early and I I would try swimming a whole set of long and once in a while I had to stop just because I couldn't handle it anymore. Um, yeah, I know Kippeth had that, but I, I guess I just got used to it, and, and relatively speaking, but relatively speaking to what the, you swim today, we're nowhere, you know, 6,000, 6, 6,500 was considered quite large in my day, and now 6,000, 6,500 is a very average workout. Uh, the goggles were a god, they are, uh, uh, Jeff Farrell said it once time at a, at a Yale 100th reunion, but goggles were the greatest invention of swimming. Sw uh, uh, suits being fancy, uh, that's fine. Br new lane lines, like we, our lane lines were a little buoy and a rope, there was no such thing as, um, all these things that have come up, that's great. Uh, and all the technology that's great but the goggles were the one thing that made swimming what it is when the goggles come in you could train so much more you could do what people were capable of doing uh, and that is the single most most important in, uh, invention whatever that came in this seriously is swimming weights ex all those things are just additional because I, I, I just the fact that the, you know it, when I master swim I couldn't do it I couldn't swim without goggles when I was master swimming. I couldn't believe it. I used to do it. And the kids today, they, they can't even begin to swim without them. Well, as you very well know, Doc Councilman was really one of the, the leading minds behind the creation of the International Swimming Hall of Fame. Did he ever give you a sense of the history of the sport? Oh, yeah. That's what I grew up on. Uh, he immediately showed me the books and the books with the national champions ever since day one in the early 1900s. In fact, he used to have me compare myself how fast I could go compared to what years and champions. And we learned all about all the names, all the, the, the champs and stuff. In fact, I have an original copy of Swim World, number one and two, that Kippeth had put out in, the year, in 1952 or 53 that he gave me uh, afterwards. Um, Doc was very historical. He, he loved the history of it and how things evolved and who was who. Uh, and he, he always he embedded it in me, so I've just carried it through over the years. I, and, and I love to keep track of it, uh, of the history of, of the American swimming. Well, you also mentioned something about a fellow named Ralph Flanagan, and you had some something, uh, I guess maybe a little question about Michael Phelps being so young. Tell me a little, what do you remember about Flanagan? Well, I learned who Ralph Flanagan was. I didn't realize that it, at the time that he was the youngest swimmer on an Olympic team in, what, 32 or something. But what happened was that when this thing article came out, when Phelps made the team at 15, it stated how Michael was the youngest swimmer since Ralph Flanagan. Well, that was an instant recall for me because I had learned about him by reading how many times he was national champion. But the papers never, nobody ever published. They just said a name like Ralph Flanagan, period. And they never mentioned that he was one of the great swimmers of his era as he grew older and he won many national titles, indoor, outdoor, distance, all that. And I just found it unique because nobody, no, nobody is quite aware of it or dug that far beyond the name attaching it to Michael Phelps. I, just one of those unusual things. I had no way to publicize it. <laughs> So Doc really did stress that whole history. Oh, absolutely! All the uh, everything, uh, uh, Duke Kahnemoka, Wise Muller, the whole thing. How Wise Muller trained, <laughs> you know, a shower, a little swim, and another shower. That was his training. But uh, yeah, and, and bringing up the names and the famous Hawaiian name. Of course, he went to school with some of them, and 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 a lot of the names from the 20s and 30s and things that. I was not aware of or wouldn't have been except he always brought it up and, and, and he gave a lineage but that was his style. It was history and those kind of things was a big thing to him. You know, it, it, and, 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 and where things will evolve and who was who and, and, and he was that way even all the years that he was coaching and, and, and I, I just find it interesting that we don't do more of tying the history of what we have in swimming. Now you mentioned the broad ripple pool. Tell me what your recollection is of the Broad Ripple Pool. Massive. It was 100 meters long, about 60 meters wide. It was like a lake. And the bulkhead for the racing course was out in the middle. And the national championships, I swam it there in 1958 uh, when, I, when we moved out there. And there were some women's national champ. In fact, the women's national championship in the summer of 60 
was at Broad Ripple Pool, and they used to have to canoe the officials out to the pla out to the uh, bulkhead out there. It was a uh, it was an enormous pool, a million and a half gallons. Uh, it's long gone now, but uh, they had the Olympic trials there in 1920. <laughs> but uh, it was a, a something special. There's another one in town still exists, the Riviera Club, which is only a couple miles away, which is almost 100 meters long and about 60 meters wide, divided up into many courses, but it's one body of water. Were there other pools like that that you swam in? Did you ever swim in the Sunlight Pool or Fly Shacker Pool or any of these other giant pools? I was in Fly Shacker just uh, we were at a national championships in 1959, and Doc took us all to see Flyshacker because of it's unusual. I did get we did get to swim in it the day we were there. Uh, uh, that is 330 meters long, and I once walked the bottom of it after it was drained with my future with swimmers. I used to take them there. I can still locate it because it's next to the zoo, and now it's a parking lot. Uh, where it had sat, but you can tell where the pool was if you go, if you know what you're looking at. Uh, I, I, that was astounding. I have never, uh, they, they used to have a, a boat out in the middle for a lifeguard. Well, George, thanks for taking the time and sharing some of the history of our sport with us. And the great Hall of Famer, George Breen. Always great to go back into the archives and hear from some of the best athletes we've seen in our sport. Well, that concludes today's Morning Swim Show. Make sure to go online to watch all of our interviews archived on SwimmingWorld.com. I'm Tiffany Elias. Have a great weekend.